In today's video, uh, I'm going to be covering the orientation of the ingot uh, as relates to first bar and then uh, making, say, a knife, sword, what have you. So there are really only three basic orientations that you can go with. Um, we've got top as spine, top as face, and top as end. And the reason I'm specific about where the top is, is that where I've put this asterisk on my uh, crude little ingots, um, that's the last part of the ingot to solidify and uh, has, generally speaking, not just the highest level of impurities, but also um, since it is the last place to solidify, any place who's, anybody who's familiar with casting uh, knows that as metals solidify, they shrink. And uh, a big part of uh, casting is setting yourself up so you don't end up with a shrinkage cavity. Now, in wood ingots, you can get an actual shrinkage cavity there in the center. Every once in a while you'll get it. Uh, in steel industry it's referred to as a pipe. Um, generally it's not uh, an actual uh, void or pipe or you know seam there. However, uh, you will get a lot more porosity in this area. Um, as everything's shrinking up, you'll get areas that are essentially trapped and as the, the steel solidifies, it leaves a little void. If you, uh, if you work the ingot properly, you can close up most of those, but that area in the top center is uh, very prone to cracking uh, during the forging process. The sort of odd shape of a Wootz ingot makes cracking even more likely. Um, so the fact that you've got this sort of weak material at the beginning that if you're going to get cracking that's probably where it will be so um, looking at this uh, the top as spine uh, this is uh, probably the most common historically speaking um, uh, a huge number of antique woods blades uh, single-edged antique woods blades when you look at them there is actually a seam or crack right down the spine of the blade. Uh, and this is where that top center has been compressed and elongated along one edge of the bar to become the spine of the blade. Uh, you know, so great advantage of that. You can, you know, as long as you're willing to accept that seam in the spine, you can just take your ingot and forge it right out, use the whole thing, you'll end up with a seam, but you'll also, that you'll end up with that sort of outer rim, the, the rim, uh, you know, the surface of the bowl, so to speak, which is uh, the best material, that ends up as your cutting edge. So, great move if you're doing a single edge blade. Um, if you're doing a double-edged blade, you don't have that luxury. Uh, and in that case, most likely, uh, you know, a, a large number of historical blades would have then been forged out top as face. Um, now, uh, the disadvantage of this is you've got that kind of crunchy material right on the face of your bar. Um, so if you're going to start getting cracks and things like that, they are right you know, dead center. A um, couple ways you can deal with that. Uh, you know, one, obviously, uh, you know, it's pretty likely that as they were forging, if cracks showed up, you know, go in there with a hot chisel or something like that, you can chisel out some of that uh, crappy material, uh, especially once you get to a bar shape or have this forged down maybe into a disc, you know, just so it'll sit nicely on the anvil. Um, so, you know, you're not going to get 100% uh, of your starting material. Uh, you can't use all of it. Some of it is almost certainly going to have to get ground away, 
uh, you know, scooped out with a chisel in some fashion. Uh, you can, depending on the size of what you're making and the size of your starting ingot, uh, you can uh, get away with a little bit of uh, that crunchy material still there if you split your bar in half um, and make a blade out of either end. The, you know, and basically use that iffy material in the, as the uh, tang of the blade. Um, and obviously, you can only do that to a certain degree. The tang needs to also be strong. Um, but once you get past the initial forging, this center area doesn't, uh, doesn't behave so much. You know, it's not just cracking and falling apart. It behaves a bit more like wrought iron. So you'll have a very fibrous material. Um, so that's also a historical method and, um, you know, worth, worth exploring. Uh, the last one is top as end. And in this uh, scenario, you forge out such that uh, your top becomes one end of the bar, concentrating all that crappy material down at one end. Um, now, if you're working under uh, a nice big press or hammer and you have, uh, have the ability to uh, slap a, you know, a weld a bar on the end, or, you know, I often did it right in that center uh, crunchy material, uh, you can forge out this way, and this concentrates all your junk at one end of the bar. You just cut it off, call it a loss, and you've got nice solid material the rest of the way. Now, depending on how it forges out, you may, uh, you may lose a good piece of this bar. But again, uh, you know, maybe 30 or 40 percent even that has to get cut off before you get away from, uh, you know, iffy material in the center. But, uh, you know, if you have the right equipment, um, that can actually be the most economical, simply because you're not having to repeatedly stop and grind away material. Uh, in the top as spine uh, technique or orientation, if you want you know, really fully solid material, no seam in the spine, you need to stop periodically as you're forging down uh, and go in with an angle grinder or a, uh, you know, you can just use a small wheel on a belt grinder, grind out some material, go back to forging, you know, do that repeatedly until you've got all solid material. Um, and, Obviously, uh, top as spine, you can also do the same thing I was talking about with top as face, where if you're cutting that in half, you know, you grind away most of the iffy material, um, but then, you know, you can leave a little bit that's going to be in the spine, or not the spine, sorry, the, the tang, so that uh, you don't have to make 100% clean. Um, you just make sure that you are in really good shape over you know the majority of the length and maybe you've got one spot that was just really causing you problems you can uh, you can get away with having that be down at the very point of your tank now uh, there are some additional uh, historical techniques one um, that uh, I first saw used by Nico Heinenen and I, I have used it myself uh, also is uh, you know, sort of begin forging down as you might for top as face, so down into a disc, um, and then punch out the center, you know, hot punch the center right out. And what that'll do is you basically take that very center crunchy material and, uh, you know, pop it out as though you were, you know, going to be forging a hammer or something like that. And, um, and then, so now you've got a donut. You can split that in half. You can cut it in one place, open it up. Uh, this works, again, as long as you've got the tools for it. Uh, it's not something that would be straightforward to do by hand. If you've got a friend with a sledgehammer, you know, might, that might do the trick. Um, so 
other reasons you might choose one of these versus uh, another would be, uh, I guess I, I would refer to it as uh, density of pattern. So as the original dendrites form during uh, solidification, they are essentially uh, equally spaced in all three axes. So um, if you look at the shape of your ingot, and it, again, depends on the shape of your crucible uh, and you know how big an ingot you're making, but if you look at your ingot, whichever dimension is largest is going to have the largest number of dendrites across it. So if we if we think of this in pattern welding terms, uh, you know, going across the face here, I have a very high uh, high layer count, so to speak, and a much lower layer count running uh, through the height of my ingot, assuming that I've got kind of a, a standard looking bowl shaped ingot. Um, and, you know, sort of a hemisphere sort of thing. And so what this means is that depending on which of these you use, you get a different density of pattern in your different dimensions. So in the top as spine, you are ex compressing across your largest dimension, therefore your highest layer count. So uh, theoretically, you'll get the highest density of pattern going that direction. Um, similarly, the top as end, since, you know, both of my directions of compression are across the largest uh, layer count, you know, layer in quotes here, uh, you know, going across the, the greatest number of dendrites. Uh, again, very high density pattern, theoretically. Uh, top as face, you have, you're, you're working across the lowest number of, uh, lowest number of dendrites. So one could imagine that you'd get the lowest density of pattern. Um, what I have found is uh, working top as face. Uh, in many cases, what I end up with is just a very stretched out pattern, actually, because uh, since most of my work is bringing these sides in, I'm essentially compressing the pattern on the surface. Get more of a uh, more of a look as though I'd done a high layer bar, and I'm looking at the edge grain. I've worked it, you know, with the edge as uh, as my face. So this gives you a little bit of a starting point uh, for you know thinking about which direction you might want to try forging out. Uh, these two, definitely uh, traditional. Um, we know that a huge number of blades were made uh, with the top of spine orientation. We know some blades at least were made uh, top as face. The top as end strikes me as pretty unlikely, uh, historically speaking. Um, just because they would not have had the ability to weld a handle onto it. And if you can't weld a handle onto it, it's a really awkward shape uh, to hold with tongs. Um, obviously, it's an awkward shape no matter what, but both of these two, your very first step is you will set your ingot face down on the anvil. So now if you have a pair of tongs that holds around the edges. You've got that flat face of the ingot down on your anvil. Now you can forge on the top and get this work down into a disc and then decide which direction you're gonna go from there. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much it for this one. Uh, again, if you've got questions, I have worked uh, in all of these uh, di uh, directions orientations. I have also done the, uh, you know, done a donut, opened it up. I've done a, a bunch of different things. Um, you know, how I'm working right now is a little bit of a variation on one of these. So, uh, but, you know, that's the kind of thing I really want you to discover for yourself because, you know, 
why do this if not uh, not for the journey so again if you got questions ask them in the comments or uh, you can find me on Instagram it's at Peter Burt Knives and uh, you can ask questions there thanks for watching